morning, everyone. So I'm just going to finish uh, the last talk of uh, the previous session. So my talk is about use of simulation in patient safety. So many of you would have heard simulation in the context of medical education. Many of you would have heard how NMC has mandated having a simulation labs in medical colleges. And many of you would have seen a lot of very well done skin labs across the country. But the talk of mine today is not about talking about medical education. It's about how do we use medical simulation in the context of improving patient safety. And we've heard lots and lots about patient safety today and how important it is. And that's the theme of the whole conference. So bear me with me for around 10 to 15 minutes. And I'll just try to uh, convey my idea about how we can think about using simulation in a much, much better fashion. Not in the terms of how we use mock codes, but using integrating simulation to the patient care and how we can actually make the patient care much better. So when we talk about any innovation, you know, it's very important we talk about why. It's important because today, you know, we know with the Digital India Initiative, there are many more medical companies, there are many more uh, companies which are coming up and they're shutting their operation by third year. The reason why that happens is many of them focus on how and what. Now let's look at the mobile market uh, today. There are so many mobile phones being launched. And, why they, and many of them come with much better cameras, much better RAM, but they don't, fo they don't focus on the question, why do we need it? And that's one of the main reasons why the Apple phone became so successful, because they put customer at the center. So today when I speak for next 10 to 15 minutes, I would really want each of you to think, why do we think simulation is so important? Why, why do we think simulation can be used and improve patient safety? So I'm sure most of you have heard about disruptive innovations. That is something uh, majority of the CEOs go through. And disruptive innovation is very interesting. You know, disruption not in the terms of bad way, but a disruption in a good way. So you know, when uh, in 1980s, when the computer started, IBM was first into the computer business. And they started building computers. And because they wanted to become more powerful, more powerful computers, what happened in the process was that this computer started consuming the entire room. But unfortunately, in this whole process of building computers, what they didn't realize, that people were looking at having computers in their desktops. Because they didn't look at this emerging market of wanting computers on their uh, desktops, they lost onto the entire business of computers. And gradually what happened was people wanted on the lap, and now today, we have computers uh, on the mobile phone. So what happens in this process is, in this process of building big and big businesses, more and more powerful things, people just lose sight of what are people wanting, okay? So for example, in my own medical school, when I was training, all of us had Nokia phone. Today, no one owns a Nokia phone because the whole thing about smartphone came up. People were obvious. The Nokia was completely obvious that people were looking for something better and completely lost onto that business. And there are many, many more examples of that kind. Now, why I'm talking about that is it's very important for us to look into how we provide care for our patients. Now, like Dr. Uh, Vijay in, in the inaugural address, he spoke very nicely about how the care has changed now. It's no longer solo practice. It's multidisciplinary team which responds to life-threatening emergencies. So what we know now is that ICU has made survival of the sickest possible, right? So now the care we want to provide has changed leaps and bounds. It's no longer one person, one uh, uh, solo person providing care. Over the last decade or so, we have seen that ICUs have become technology-laden, multidisciplinary and multi-professional. What that means is today, even the rarest of surgeries, you know, a lot of complicated patients are surviving, a very complex surgeries are being performed, but then lots and lots of process, you know, it, it's a team-driven care. For example, a cardiac surgery today, cardiologist gets involved, anesthetist gets involved, apart from cardiac surgeon, intensivists get involved, they have a pre-operative meeting, you discuss the whole thing, and then a patient gets into operating table. So this is a very nice quote from Professor uh, Cyril Chantler. He says, medicine used to be simple, ineffective, and relatively safe a couple of decades ago. But today what has happened, it's become complex, but very effective. Lots of sick patients do survive. But unfortunately, it also has become potentially dangerous. All right? So what has happened now, let's take an example of how the ICU works today. So we have the ICU. It has nurses, it has physicians, it has physiotherapists, it has nurses, ICU directors, residents. <clears throat> 
you have clinicians in the ward and you have parents now unfortunately there is a huge chance of having intra team conflicts inter team conflicts between the medical team and patient conflicts so that's the real real world today we are living in now because we have moved from a solo practice area to a multidisciplinary team providing care with which we are able to save many more lives what has happened in the process is medical errors safety also became a very important aspect to it the by product of providing team based care the by product of providing a technology driven care with which we are able to create so much of difference also had a unfortunate by product and that's about patient safety and this was a, a thing which have been quoted by many to err is human and they showed that the medical errors are significant part number 2 or number 3 reason why patients lose their life now the interesting part is that led to lots of changes you know people realized that systems have to be put in place checklists came up many more things came up but unfortunately even after a decade of that not much has changed even now we today talk that medical errors are still a significant portion of why patients uh, suffer in hospitals now when you look into all this but why these things happen it's very important to understand that many of them are related to human factors now <clears throat> it is not that our country india i mean it's all western data what about our country and there you know even in our country at least when the uh, many of the developing countries when they review data they found out that around 10% of medical errors do happen of which at least 80% are preventable and this is being reported in the uh, newspapers too so i'm not going to go through the evidence quickly in the view of lack of time but we know there are lots of published literature saying that lots of human factors medication errors do happen around 10 to 20% of them and these two happen significantly in the intensive care environment so <clears throat> if this is the case then how do we decrease it now what important document came out of this is it's incredibly important that the, when the care is being provided as a team please train as a team now what's happening with lot of our als courses bls courses and lots of these courses is doctors go train nurses train none of them train together unfortunately everyone trains separately and that's a biggest downfall because then you know okay fine all of us are trained everyone is certified with bls als but unfortunate reality is that when it comes to the patient they all suffer because everyone has been trained separately all right so now from that context let's think can simulation be that disruptive innovation what you are thinking about in how we provide patient care now this is the reality today right so many of us come to this kind of conferences gain knowledge now let's take i go to conference i read a lot about pneumonia i also go to workshop learn how to intubate a patient but when a patient comes with respiratory distress i really struggle to know when to intubate this patient and also in reality none of us are going to work separately we are going to work with nurses technicians and lot and people from different professions and none of us unfortunately trained together and this is where the whole crisis resource management principles came and these are all the key points of that crm principle and what we know now is there is a need to train on human factors it just cannot happen on its own just focusing on knowledge is not going to help and it's really really important we need to think about training ourselves in human in human factors and that's where probably simulation stands really tall because this is one tool where you know we can't we should not think medical simulation as someone something to be used to be trained training students or nurses no even clinicians who are heading the department need to undergo this training on a regular basis it's incredibly important because the human factors is something which every person in healthcare needs to undergo training and there are quite a few studies which are coming up showing that when they have used simulation as a training tool there have been improvement in patient outcomes because at the end of the day you need to show how do we improve patient outcomes now i just want you to uh, spend little bit of time i'm sorry um, i don't know if you can play that video is it possible because i am unable to yeah <clears throat> draw each one of them 13 14 and his length it will help them at 15 but this is the task at hand right now the tee shot at 13 looking anxiously so this is save all right so he is this is one of the important moments of golf game i i don't play golf well but even for me what i saw in that whole shot is that it was a most important point of time he has to play that shot 
he takes back a step and practices a swing and then plays. So for him, it is a psychological simulation. Now, this is after all a game. You know, today, uh, we, we hear about IPL teams, cricket teams, hockey teams. What do they do? You know, they go and play practice matches. Now, why would a person like Virat Kohli, who's been playing right from his childhood every day, even needs a practice session. He needs a practice session before he goes for a game. A team which has been playing for many years, like India, when they go to teams like, uh, when they travel South Africa or Australia, they need practice games. Why do they need it? They're all professionals. But the problem is, all, this is we're talking about game. Today we look at any high stakes industry, whether it's nuclear, whether it's airlines, all of them have, take a practice session. Medicine is the only high stake industry where there is no practice time before a game time. So none of us, for, uh, as an intensivist, for example, if I were to place a center line or intubate, I don't practice. None of our surgeons, if you have operated one case, a rare case last year, you would not practice it just before you operate. All right. So I just want you to think from that point of view that do we actually think about practicing before we actually deliver care? So this has becomes important because so we I, we just spoke about how airlines industry do uh, do it because what happens is you know air crash is an extremely rare event but then if that happens they undergo practice so many times that they they know actually what to do uh, before that kind of crisis happens. So there are many events like that in medical practice like cardiac arrest and. A pericardial tamponade, which we don't see very often, but it's really important that we practice these situations. When they happen, we need to be ready. So when we talk about simulation, I'll just give this wonderful video example about how we can actually think about simulation. So there is this conjoint twins which is about to deliver. This is a video I've got from Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And they just didn't know how they are going to manage this conjoint twins when the child comes out. So they actually went through the uh, scans and MRIs of those conjoint twins. They created a simulator about how their conjoint twins might look like and they practiced a child coming out and then stabilizing the child. So can I just play the top video please? Top one video. You can click on the left hand side. Go back please. The top one. The top green box. Yes. So this was the last video. Actually, there's a video on the top. Is it, is it possible to click? Yes. Okay, I think it's not playing now. So, so the, the last video what you saw was when finally the child actually came out. So they, uh, I mean, if you had, had that video played, you would have seen how different it was because when the child actually came, you could see everyone very relaxed, smiling, laughing because they knew exactly what, what to do. The first video was actually about on a simulator, which looked exactly similar, but there was so much of chaos and confusion not knowing what to do. So why I wanted you all to uh, 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 think about that is, you know, this is, we are talking about simulation using inpatient care area. So many things can go wrong in a conjoint twins like this. We don't know how to set the ventilator, whom to intubate, what kind of equipments to be ready. By beautiful example to show how you can use simulation in your point of care, care area, to ensure that you get a safe and the best care to the patient. So when I talk about simulation here, it's important to understand I'm not talking about setting a big skill lab, spending crores and crores of money, no. What I'm talking here is how do we integrate simulation principles in patient care area? Keeping a simulator in emergency room, keeping it in ICU, keeping it in anesthesia room, figuring out how do I make sure that the patients when they come from emergency room to ICU, they're safe. How do I ensure that the patient coming from the operating room to ICU, they become safe? How do I ensure I shift the patient from ICU to the MRI scan room in a safe fashion, all right? So we are thinking about utilizing simulation principles in terms of patient safety. How do I set the patient bed ready? How, where do I keep crash, crash cards ready? How do I identify latent safety threats in my ICU? So even when you talk about training someone with CPR, you know, just conducting one mock code blue once a month, it might be okay for accreditation, but from patient care of safety, that's still not good. So Let's imagine I have a patient in multiple inotropes. I know this patient might arrest today. We can use simulation, keep a simulator next to that patient bedside. Nurse is starting her shift right away. She runs 
learn CPR for two minutes so that if a patient arrests, she is absolutely cognitively ready to recognize and start compression. So we're talking about just in time and just in place training. So this is just again one more example of a nurse of ours. She wanted to learn intubation. So we made her try intubation, learn intubation on a mannequin five times. And when there was a real elective intubation, she practiced on this mannequin and then intubated. She intubated like a pro, much better than an anesthetist would intubate. So I'm just giving an example about how we can think about using simulation to make our uh, patient care safe. Again, lots of people have spoken about how do we need to move from a person approach to system approach. Now, unfortunately, many times any error happens, we focus on countermeasures like uh, penalizing that individual. With that happens is no one reports any errors because then you know you're going to get penalized. It's incredibly important for us to understand that humans are fallible. No one enters the hospital saying that I'm going to harm somebody, I'm going to destroy someone else, I'm going to be careless. People try their best, but still errors do happen. And it's really important that like we just discussed in the morning, we need to move from a react, pathological, reactive to a generative kind of a culture. That's important. And that's the kind of systems we need to build in the hospitals. And simulation can go a long way in kind of creating that kind of culture. So simulation is just not purely about medical education. Huge role in how we can make the patient care safe. And with that, I conclude my talk. Thank you very much for patient hearing.